So my name is Hoi Han and um, I live in Beijing. I'm 40 years old. I've been in Beijing for about 16 years now and I am the CEO and founder of My China Roots. My China Roots helps uh, overseas Chinese trace their ancestry and connect with their roots. And it really was a, the origins of My China Roots was an extension of my own experience because I was born and raised in the Netherlands and my family came from Indonesia and 180 years ago my family came from China. So southern China, Indonesia, which was a Dutch colony when my ancestors arrived and then in 1950 my ancestors, my grandparents moved from Indonesia to the Netherlands. So I grew up in a very white rural environment and uh, very Dutch schools and I never really knew anything about China. I was always very interested in stories. So my grandfather and my father would tell me stories about how they grew up, how their grandparents grew up. But that was all about Indonesia. So when, when I was in my mid-teens, I started thinking more about China and, you know, where is China? If we're Chinese, why don't we speak Chinese? Why don't we know anybody in China? Why have we never been as a family, not even a on a holiday? Um, so that, that was just questions that, that entered my mind and, and, and China grew and grew as this, as this concept, as this more than a country. It really was a concept in my mind of, you know, I want to know more about it. My name is Chris Lin Chu. I am Malaysian Chinese American. Sometimes I don't know the order in which to say those three words. Uh, depends on where I am, who I'm with. Um, but I'm ethnically Chinese. My parents were born and raised in Malaysia. I was born and raised in the US. So over the summer times growing up for holidays, when we'd go back to visit family, it was always, oh, we're gonna go home to Malaysia because um, that's where you know, our grandparents were, that's where my parents, a lot of their childhood friends are. Um, so yeah, it was always like, okay, obviously we have a home here in New Jersey. That's where I'm having my education, having my friends, uh, spending my adolescence. Um, but summertime, it was going back to Malaysia and while most kids went to summer camp, I was at the beach, <laughs> I was you know, drinking coconuts, um, I was eating amazing food, I was um, always surrounded by a lot of like multiculturalism. Um, my dad would always joke that Malaysia is kind of like a melting pot, the melting pot of the East, um, or alternately like a salad bowl, depending on how well you think those cultures actually blend. Um, but I think my my parents wanted to raise us in Malaysia, actually. Um, so I actually did go to preschool there. I lived there for two or three years when I was younger. Um, but because of like economic uh, recession crisis things in the 90s, uh, his company ended up moving us back to the States. Um, so then I grew up like American American. <laughs> um, but I think for him, it was important for us to grow up feeling connected to our roots. Like he, you know, my parents love their culture. They're very proud of it, um, the diversity. Uh, so there's definitely like a very deep love there. Um, and taking us back to Malaysia over the summers was my parents' way of trying to help us still feel connected. Um, and I think like in many ways they have succeeded um, in passing on that, that, that pride, I guess, um, enough that I would want to pass it on to my children one day. Um, at the same time, there is always the weird sense of, oh, I feel most Malaysian when I'm outside of Malaysia, uh, because when I'm actually in Malaysia, suddenly I'm like, oh, wait, here are all the ways in which I'm not as culturally fluent, you know, as someone who really did grow up here. Well, when I, to be honest, when I came, so the, the reason for me to go to China was mostly curiosity. So like I mentioned, this, this wondering of, uh, I know I'm Chinese, but I have no idea what that actually means. Uh, that was the key reason for me to just see what it was like. China at the time, it was 2004, it was uh, in the run-up to the Olympics. Everything was building, everything was looking forward. It was just really developing socially, politically, economically. So I decided, you know, it, uh, other than this, this curiosity, I had this very intense growth that fascinated me too. And I had studied law uh, and political science. So from that, uh, as that aspect um, intrigued me too. So I decided to stay. Uh, I was working in, I was more in business, consulting, government relations, nothing to do with roots. But at the, at the same time, I was just as a hobby starting to do my own family history research. So I asked my, my parents, aunts and uncles, 
what do you know about China? And they didn't know much, but through basically through a distant cousin that I found out lived in Xiamen in Fujian, southern China, I got to know more and more. So I got to know first actually my mom's maternal grandmother's ancestral village in Fujian. And then things started rolling from there. I started visiting ancestral villages in Fujian. So first of all, I found out that my, all my ancestors basically were from this province called Fujian. I didn't really know that before either. Um, and it was about 2007, 2008 that I started traveling south more, uh, doing research. Also, at times, finding out that I went to the completely wrong village. And, you know, I, I went to a place and I thought, oh, this is my ancestral village. This is so cool. And, you know, I was talking to local people there. And, and at one place, actually, there was the, the local mayor received us. And, and there was media and film and, and everything, a lot of a whole circus. And then I found out that it was my ancestral village at all, and basically it was all for nothing. So, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of back and forth, and it was a big, pr a long process. So maybe some of the overseas Chinese, they will have some documents that's, that was passed on their previous ancestor, like their grandfather, when their grandfather get on a board or get a passport and uh, to just migrate to another country. And they, they may have to they may apply some documents in the archive, like American archive or some kind of things. And uh, maybe they get these documents, like their photos, uh, jacks or letters, these kind of um, things from their parents or their relatives. But yeah, that's where we get started. That's the whole materials, the whole papers, uh, the, the documents may include some possible information um, that refer to the guys, the, the, our clients uh, ancestral place. That's how we get, we, we, we need to go through all the documents first and see, oh, is there any place uh, where, where the guy uh, originally from? So then we will maybe go into that village in person to personally see that village and interview the local people there. That's how it works. And maybe we can find some traces and records in the village because, you know, China, Chinese, uh, it has a, China has a long history about uh, Zupu, Jiapu. This is a uh, family history uh, clan book. So it preserve uh, so much uh, individual, so many individual information in that kind of book. So it's kind of like um, a family history book. It, it, will, uh, it will list all the, basically most of them are males, males names uh, in, in that village. If you're born there or your sons, what's your grandparents, it's like a different family trees and pedigrees in that tree books. And sometimes you will get some uh, the, 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 your ancestor, you will find their occupations and biographies. The, it, it will all uh, record it in that Japu or Zupu. And uh, most of the Japu and Zupu are preserved in the elderly villager. So you can, you can only see that in village because maybe it's only one, one copy. It's only left one copy of that book and uh, maybe and it it dates back to maybe, I don't know, Qing Dynasty or some kind of things. And, uh, and uh, every generation pass on, they will just give to another ge generation. Every ancestor pass on and they will give to their next generation to preserve this kind of book. And basically it's kind of book that uh, refers to the whole, he, uh, whole village of the all male clans. It's the same clan, they are from the same, they, they share the same surname and uh, they are from the same place. As I went through the process of researching and finding out that every question that I got answered about our family history led to five new questions that I was curious about, it, um, yeah, it started turning into more than a curiosity, like, like a passion. And I, I noticed it was what it was doing to myself, just in terms of how I felt about myself, about cultural identity, about China, about Holland, Indonesia, my roots essentially. And I was noticing the impact it had on people that I was sharing my story with. Mostly people would think, uh, so overseas Chinese friends and family, their first reaction was always, God, this is so cool. And I never thought that, that it would be possible to, to find this type of information because people assume that because of the Cultural Revolution or other reasons, their family history, historical traces have been lost. So they most people don't even try. So that, 
that started me, that started this, this process of me thinking, well, you know, in addition to me feeling strongly emotionally about this research and about helping other people doing their research, there is a clear business case to be made too. Why is there no service that actually helps people like me? I'm obviously not that unique, you know, other people curious, other people having uh, linguistic, cultural, geographic challenges, uh, making it difficult for them to do their own um, research. So that's when the idea came up to actually start My China Roots. And um, we're helping people actually bring them back to where their ancestors lived. So our customers, we help them organize trips. We have local people on the ground that guide them, bilingual, trilingual, and uh, family reunions, the whole, the, whole, the whole package. Have you been to one of those uh, family reunions? Maybe you can talk a little yeah. bit about uh, well, like my own, uh, we, so a group of how many, well, this is probably like 80, 80 people or so, 60 to 80 people from, from Holland, from Indonesia, from China, from the US, really from everywhere. And uh, a lot of people I didn't know, obviously. I mean, I, I think I knew maybe 15 or 20 of them. So you really meet in this place where you know that you're, you're all from. So there was this really yeah, this extremely interesting dynamic and this instant feeling of, wow, we, we have this very deep uh, background in common, even though our lives have all, you know, everybody's from everywhere. Everybody is used to different types of food, wearing different, different types of clothing, uh, different ages, and yet you have this common bond that, that ties you together. I mean, for sure, throughout elementary, middle school, high school, there was always the general kind of angst of just social belonging and oh, the popular enough group and all that kind of teenage angst. Um, there's definitely that normal level. Um, I think, I think the first time that maybe ethnicity played into it, where I was like, wait, is someone treating me different, or do I want to? distance myself from a group of people because of that part of my identity. I remember in high school, my mom was like, hey, you should join the Asian American club at school. And I was like, what, like fobby people? Like just the people that do this all the time, peace signs? Like, no, why would I ever want to associate myself with them? Like, that's ridiculous. But then I actually got to know other Asian Americans at school in classes, you know, just individuals, people. Um, and I was like, wait, like, y'all are really cool. In fact, we can connect way more easily uh, than with other people um, from different cultural backgrounds because um, we have the shared, you know, experiences. Um, then I was like, OK, maybe I'll hang out with the club more. I'll come to more events. Oh, I'll get involved. Oh, now I will actually like maybe be part of the leadership, et cetera. Um, invite other people to come to Asian American Club, right? But I think I wouldn't have been able to say this at the time, but I definitely had internalized um, racism, you know, internalized contempt towards my own people. Then I'm like, wait, that's an internalized bias. Um, that's an internalized wall. Where did that come from? Uh, is it true? Why am I scared of it? And then what is true? And how do I replace that with what is true? Um, and do I need to have some, you know, curiosity there to actually learn, right, and explore and be open? Um, and chances are, you know, you'll find you have way more in common <laughs> uh, than you ever expect. So, yeah, I think that was, yeah, the whole Asian American Club story was my first, like, oh, I have, I'm racist towards my own people. <laughs> in Chinese tradition, um, one's ancestors are always part of oneself more than in the West. So there's this continuity across the generations that is much that goes deeper in in Chinese identity and 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 culture. So, you know, we are the extension of our ancestors. So now, if you go back and you look at migration history, especially Guangdong, Fujian, um, most the overwhelming majority of people who left they left for economic reasons. They left to make money and they left to make that money for the good of one's home. So the expectation was to go overseas and send money back to the family, uh, back home, and then also to go back home. So people actually never really left with the prospect of just staying there and you know, leaving forever. It was always with the mindset of my home will be in China, I will leave for the good of home, and I will return back home. 
So for the people that they, that they left behind in, in their mind temporarily, it was also the sense of, you know, they'll be coming back. And fast forward like a hundred years or however long it was, people, like descendants of the emigrants that come back is a very natural thing. So for the villagers today, it's sort of, yeah, of course you're back. You're, you know, you, uh, maybe it was the case that your great grandfather was supposed to be back, but you know, it's fine. It, you know, it's the same dynamic sort of process. So there's this sense of almost normalcy of, of this natural course of events that brings people back. Now on the, on the other end, on the visitor end, um, like for myself, if I speak for myself, I, I really, I was born and raised in Holland and I wasn't, I didn't grow up with that sense of home is China. Home was Holland for me. So for, as a visitor, you go with this sense of discovery of something new and, you know, doors open up to something that you haven't seen before. So it's a very different mindset with which the visitors uh, come into the village and the, the, the hosts that receive them. People usually, and that's another interesting thing, um, people usually don't come out of it thinking, oh, now I'm Chinese or I'm, or, or I'm American Chinese or Dutch Chinese. People usually come out of it thinking, you know, I, I am me. I have, uh, my ancestors went through different stages of migration and that's just how I ended up being me. And also for myself, the key result was just that I'm completely cool with how my ancestors, where they were, what they did, and how it came to pass that I was born and raised in Holland. And sort of not feeling a need to box yourself in to either being Chinese, Dutch, or Indonesian, not having to choose. You know, if person A wants me to, wants to define me and put me in a certain box, that's fine, but I don't really care anymore. So I think that's the key thing and a key takeaway of a lot of the roots journeys that we help people um, you know, enter. There are plenty of unintended things that people say, right, where they'll just, you know, say how wonderful my English is and I'm just kind of like, you know, should I snark back and be like, I would hope so, it's like my, my, my native tongue. <laughs> um, uh, or just, you know, understand, right, that whatever they're saying is based on some false or incomplete narrative and it's not necessarily their fault and they mean well. Um, and just not be, and it's, and just, yeah, like what they say, like it doesn't change who I am, right? So I think um, whether I have had interactions in the past that I'm just blocking out now because it's like, that's my way of dealing with it. Or if people do try to categorize me in the future, it's like, well, how grounded am I? How much do I welcome myself, right? Like the more, at peace I am with all my different parts and you know the mosaic that they come together and make then like nothing can shake that <laughs> nothing can threaten it right or question it um, in a way that would make me be defensive or offensive you know when we talk about culture it's not just ethnicity it's not just nationality right there's region the United States all the different parts have their own cultures um, you've got religion as well and then how that interacts with ethnicity so like for me I also grew up in a Chinese immigrant church so that was a very interesting intersection of like just Chinese traditional values um, but then intersected with a certain brand of conservative evangelical Christianity and and that oh man the exam the the role models or the examples that I have when it comes to like how should you approach authority how do you think about success how do you think about you know all these things very much influenced by the, the intersection of those two cultures or whatever multiple cultures um, and I think for me coming to terms with my ethnicity has really changed how I see certain like scriptures for example like the whole love your neighbor as yourself idea like we we focus a lot on the love your neighbor which is really great because that question of who is your neighbor is everything it gets to the heart of you know humanity's tribalism and need to be like okay who's my us who's the them who I, I align myself with and you know that's that's my neighbor that's my family right and really every story is about family at the end of the day um, 
I think that's why we care so much about our roots and why we're connected, who we're connected to. Um, but there's the part that's like, love your neighbor as yourself, which then brings the question of like, okay, well, how do you see yourself? Do you love yourself? Do you accept yourself? Do you look down on yourself, right? Because if you do, then chances are you're gonna externalize that and look down on other people when they, you know, when you perceive them in a way that reminds you of the parts of yourself that you're insecure about or that you feel shame of. I think in the past two years, there's very clearly uh, an increase in interest. Like there's really a wave, a, a momentum uh, that we're experiencing at the moment in basically the West, which undoubtedly has to do with an increasing, increasing polarized social political environment there. And if, for instance, if you look at the US, um, like earlier this year, was it last year, you had the Crazy Rich Asians movie, you have Facebook groups that go viral, that are linked to cultural identity. There's a lot, there's really these two years, uh, there's a very strong growth in that. One of the reasons why I feel strongly about the work that we do is precisely because I noticed in myself, again, that the result wasn't that I felt more uh, culturally ingrained in any particular culture, right? I, I, the effect it had on me and and I'm happy to see that the effect that it has, has on most people that we help is that there's a lot more that a, a better awareness of one's own cultural background leads to actually more tolerance and more openness and uh, more insight that the backgrounds of most everybody in the world are actually very similar. So even though on a very micro level, yeah, my culture might be different from anybody else's, but if you just if you just take it apart and you just look at the common themes of, you know, just call it love and hate and jealousy and migration and just sacrifice, everybody has those stories. And so the actual resulting effect is one of increasing tolerance. And that's why I feel so strongly about it because it really makes me very annoyed when I, when I see people that are like extremely nationalistic or sort of this is my culture and you know combined with a sense of superiority which is often mask you know masking a, a sense of uh, insecurity but nevertheless that's exactly what i'm trying to not <laughs> sort of to, to to do away with and um, i feel convinced that if people know more about their own backgrounds they'll see more clearly that other people's backgrounds are really not that different and it only just requires communication, just curiosity. It's everywhere. Everyone is in between in some way. It's, so, it's almost like this cra like crazy endeavor that we always try to like impose a certain way of being, like a static way, whether it's a geostatic way or whatever. Um, and the language that we have, the constructs that we have to meet people, like when you first meet someone, and it's like, okay, like, hey, like, what's your name? Where are you from? Right? But that, that's like, that anchors your first perception of someone in the place where they're from, but that place is tied to your perception of geopolitical power. And I'm like, well, that just gets in the way of us being able to figure out the line that does connect us as humans, right? Um, why, why are we starting there? So like these days when I meet people, I, I don't even ask where you're from. Like my first question is just, so what brings you here? Because literally the only thing I can assume is that we are both here in this particular place, in this particular time. There's nothing else I can assume, not from how you look, how you talk, how you whatever, right? Um, and then we work backwards from there. And you just tell me your story as you are, for how it is. Um, so oh, just in betweenness, I'm like, that, that is how people are. <laughs> and the more we hold space for it um, and to just you know, accept yourself as that, like, I think that's when we'll head in a good direction. Mm -hmm.